For those of you who, who may not be banking specialists, let's start by recalling the, the role of macroprudential policies. The macroprudential policies are regulations on financial institutions to protect against systemic risk. In other words, to prevent another financial crisis. And this is opposed to traditional regulation, which focused only on regulating the finances of individual institutions themselves. Um, so I, I know that there are views on when this started, but it's an area of policy which has become very central since the global financial crisis. And so a first question posed in the program for our panel was whether macroprudential policies have succeeded in becoming useful and important in protecting the economic stability of the European Union. And in particular, whether this framework for macroprudential regulation is serving all its members well including the countries that are the focus of our attention today. Specifically, whether countries outside the euro have special needs for macroprudential policy that might cause them to look for more features or, or different features than the macroprudential framework which uh, Francesco has put in place. Um, so the program also includes another question which is sort of specific to macroprudential policies. When we, just, when we mention an EU framework for, uh, for macroprudential policies, we're talking about a very flexible, inclusive framework, which I, I believe some of the participants will describe. And the question is whether this is healthy uh, and, and useful, or whether flexible inclus and inclusive is a, another word for too big a tent um, and too hostage to volunteerism. So, it would be useful to know if panel members have any thoughts on the merits or otherwise of this big tent macroprudential approach and whether they might see lessons from this type of inclusive approach to other areas of policy that we talked about earlier. So to tackle this big agenda, I have one of the most impressive panels you could possibly imagine. Let's just say it. Um, we're going to lead off with Governor Ingvis from the Central Bank of Sweden who will tell us how macroprudential policy is working for the Nordic Baltic countries. And I believe this, is, this will give us a very immediate picture of, of the issues. Then we'll switch gear to Francesco Mazzaferro, who's the head of secretariat from the European Systemic Risk Board, who will tell us how he sees the framework from what I'm calling headquarters. And I hope also how he sees the ESRB's relations with non-Euro <coughs> countries. Then we'll switch gear again. Andrew, I'm really sorry for starting without you. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I knew you were I speaking third. I knew you were speaking third, so I could start. So then we'll switch gear to and Professor Andrew Baker from the University of Sheffield for your thoughts on the framework from a conceptual perspective. And finally, because I believe the success of the framework will depend on how countries actually choose to implement it and their thoughts. I'm going to close with messages from Christian Popper. Now, Christian previously spoke to you in his current role as senior advisor to the Vienna Initiative, but, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll speak on this panel with your hat as former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Romania. Uh, Romania has introduced uh, a new macroprudential framework and has thought long and hard about the issues that we posed earlier. So it's very appropriate if you will close this session, please. Um, let's get going. Uh, we have 10 minutes for each panelist, and uh, it's the only thing that stands be between us and the closing remarks. So, Stefan, I really look forward to learning thank from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, let me first start out by saying that it's a joy to be here with just so many former and present uh, colleagues in the, in, in the room. And I work together with many, many of you, and also those, those of you who organize these, uh, these things. Uh, it was hard not to get into the conversation about the euro joining the euro earlier, but I'll stay, I'll stay out of that, I'll stay out of that and, and, and hope that I can give you some sort of a flavor of what happens in my, my corner of the world. And this is, this is a, the, the short story is essentially trying to deal with a lot of cross-border banking. That's the bottom line. How do you, how do you go about doing, uh, doing, uh, doing this? And just to give you a flavor, you have the countries, and 
market share in terms of large Nordic cross-border banks and other banks. And you can see the same thing in the whole region, a lot of cross-border banking. You can measure this in many different ways. It doesn't matter how you do the numbers. The end result is all what you say. So this is sort of a complete, more or less uh, integrated financial, uh, financial sector. And then, of course, when things blow up, it matters how you deal with, uh, deal with that. And we have cooperated a long, long time. And actually, in medieval times, we had the first currency union a long, long time ago. So we've been at it for a long time. And we had a gold coin union, union in the 1800s. So in that respect, there is nothing new under the sun when it comes to doing these things. Very, very quickly uh, showing uh, you what cooperation actually can look like when there is no formal structure, but you are forced to cooperate. And that's when things blow up. Yeah, and that's what it looks like. If you, if you start, and this is very fast, 2007, we did a swap with the, with the ECP. I'm talking about this from the Riksbank perspective. And it was later disclosed. Uh, 2008, we do a swap with Iceland. Now you can say, why Iceland in this context? From our perspective, very, very simple, very basic. We are okay, the rest of the world is not okay. We don't get, want to get contagion into our system, so we're fighting like crazy, trying to keep Iceland over there and the Baltics over there. That's the whole exercise. Not harder, not harder than that. In the 90s, we were not okay. Total disaster, the rest of the world was okay. So completely the other way. The other way. So what do we do? Also, we do a swap with the Fed. We do, do a U.S. dollar lending facility. We do all sorts of things. I'm not going to go into any of the, any of the details. And, and uh, we do uh, emergency liquidity assistance in, in 2008 to counting an Icelandic bank, a Swedish bank, a small Swedish bank, all sorts of other things that I'm not going to talk about. We do a swap with Latvia. And then finally, towards the end here, we do also do a swap with transaction and all sorts of other things with uh, Estonia. And eventually, we survived this whole exercise, and the system did not blow up. And what uh, the Baltic countries sort of get the whole thing gradually back on track, except when it comes to one point, money laundering. Because the, the good times came back so quickly, so that that sort of fell by the wayside. And now we pay for that, and we pay a lot for that. And that's, that's a problem in itself. So we figured out how to co cooperate. And this is sort of completely outside the regular commission, the ECB, all this stuff that people in Maastricht Street here and all those that, that people normally talk about. All those others down south had nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do with it. And, and that's, that's an issue in it, in it. Except the IMF, because we needed the IMF in there to put in place proper conditionality. And that was, that was important. So as a, coming out of this, we started talking among, um, among ourselves. And back in 2011, we created the Nordic Baltic Macro Prudential Forum with central bank governors and heads of supervision. And this was created in order to discuss and coordinate uh, the development adapt, and adoption of macro prudential policy frameworks in order to identify risks and in order to discuss uh, uh, the, uh, what is relevant uh, from a macro pr prudential perspective, given what we have learned in our part of the world in other international fora. This is completely <coughs> informal. The, there, there's no legal framework surrounding this at all. We just happen to meet at the airport in <laughs> Stockholm in a room and have lunch and talk for a number of hours. It's a small group, and people tend to stay quite honest. And in that sense, when it comes to international work, Highly unusual. <laughs> this is what it can look like. Here you can see countries and financial sector issues, and this is how we keep track of things. I'm not going to go through any of that, but here this is how we keep track of what's going on in our corner of the world, and it works. And then I send, we send this twice a year to Francesco so that he can understand what we are doing in our corner. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the, that's, that's the setup. And we are trained to do, do things like this, and this is handled in a fairly efficient, uh, efficient way. And who does that exactly? Uh, it's a combination of central bank and supervisory staff. Mm -hmm. And basically, the secretariat is sort of kind of run out of the Riggs Bank, but it's... It, uh, so you have a secretariat? It's a tiny, right? tiny operation, but basically, it's with contact persons in all the institutions involved in this. 
and they are providing us with the data. We compile it and put it together like this, and then we discuss depending on the color. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the setup. And when it comes to various microprudential measures, I'm not going to go through them in, the, in detail. If you look at all the axes, you can just see that we've done all sorts of things. Whether this really will, will work or not, time will tell, but this is a sort of a good framework to keep track of what we are doing. And that's essentially what it is designed, uh, designed to do. And then here comes the challenges. You, you, you think that this is a sort of a homogenous group of countries, but that's not at all the case given the various institutional frameworks, setups. Because if you look at Estonia, Latvia, Finland, and Lithuania, they belong to the Eurozone, and they are also part of the SSM. Then you have Denmark with a fixed exchange rate, Sweden with a floating exchange rate, members of the Euro European Union. And then you have Norway and Iceland being EEA uh, members. So in that respect, the institutional setup is quite different uh, uh, for, for all these countries, but that does re not really matter at all when you talk among plumbers, because plumbers like to talk to plumbers and we talk about the plumbing. That's what, we, that's what we do. This stuff is sort of imposed on us by the politicians, and we don't talk about the politics of it. So that's, that's, that's just the way, uh, the way it is. Also, when it comes to how this is uh, the institutional setup, it, it differs, you can see, in Estonia and in Lithuania, it's done by the central bank. In Sweden, Finland, and Latvia, it's done by the supervisory authority. Denmark and Norway, I don't know if there are any Danes or Norwegians in the room, they might complain, but I think it's the government uh, that is involved. And in Iceland, they have some kind of, a, just recently established some kind of a, a council. So the domestic setup is completely <coughs> all over the place. And still it's possible for us to sort of to talk about the technical details and how this, uh, how, how this, uh, did this work. And in that respect, it's not that different from what you call the Vienna uh, Initiative, because there's a, we have a common interest in talking about these things. A few years ago, I said, given that the ESRB is beautiful and up and running, uh, why do we do this? Uh, just get rid of it, because we have enough to do anyway. But then there was a consensus, no, this works OK. So there was no interest at all in actually closing the shop, and just people were quite happy keeping the whole thing, uh, the whole thing going. And why? One issue that we often talk about, which is important and that comes back time and time again, is that here you can see the blue and the red bars. They catch foreign <coughs> branches and foreign subsidiaries, and that means that given that you have this much cross-border banking in one form or the other, then reciprocity becomes important. Reciprocity becomes really, really important because otherwise you don't have a level playing field at all. And that's why you need, need to keep track of who is doing what, when, and why, and to what extent countries are actually ready to re re reciprocate in one form or the other. Then we have the European Systemic Risk Board, which is, uh, which is kind of the formal aspect of this whole thing. And despite not being members of the EU, when it comes to the ESRB, Iceland and Norway sort of were allowed into the door uh, as observers, and that worked, uh, worked okay for many years now. They have become EEA. EEA is part of this system, so basically the ESRB used a pra very pragmatic uh, approach that made it possible to to eventually, slowly over time, give them a, a seat at the table, and that work, that has worked. So the, the main lessons uh, so far is, is that this informal group, the MBMS, has promoted good and open discussions among us. There is an element of peer pressure in this, and particularly with, that is particularly the case when we talk about implementing or not implementing various microprudential measures. Uh, just to give you an example, in 2008, we were concerned about the developments in the Baltic countries, since we are seriously misbehaving when it comes to our housing market. Now, the Baltic countries are concerned about our housing market. So this sort of, the pendulum swings uh, back and forth when, when we discuss. And we are also um, presently struggling with the implementation of measures that the Baltic countries put in place, uh, put in place already actually prior to the crisis. And as I said, 
uh, reciprocity, a key topic that comes back again and again when you have a lot of cross-border banks. Another topic uh, that comes back uh, once in a while within, our, uh, uh, within the group and in our corner of the world is, is that in addition to, to, to what I just said, there also exists a Nordic Baltic Stability Group with ministries of finance, central bank supervisory and resolution authorities where we discuss basically crisis management in one way or the other. And in 2019, uh, we conducted a Nordic Baltic crisis exercise run out of all the capitals with 31 authorities, eight Nordic Baltic countries <coughs> and relevant e EU institutions participating. And this was run in real time with about a little bit more than 300 people participating in this. So this was this is probably the one of the largest crisis management exercises ever when it comes to dealing with cross-border uh, uh, stuff. And now where people are discussing what came out of this, what uh, what did we uh, learn, and how do we deal with the, uh, deal with the, uh, these things uh, going going uh, forward. So. Short story, that's, uh, that's where we are. We've spent almost 10 years talking to each other. And so far, so good, it seems to work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. I knew we would get this super clear overview of how it can work well. Uh, Francesco, would you mind giving us the view from headquarters? And just to be a bit <coughs> provocative, uh, what Stefan described, is that helpful? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. Well, first of all, I've been asked to speak of the SRB as an institution where belonging to the euro area or not does not make a difference. Uh, this is the reason why. And indeed, uh, this is true also in terms of governance. So, uh, Stefan Ingves uh, is uh, the, uh, the vice chair of, uh, of the SRB and he's been following Marvin King and Mark Carney. Uh, Boris is a member of the steering committee. They are all uh, non-euro area officials, but more important also from the point of view of what we are doing, uh, we have been just speaking of reciprocation, which is fundamental, you know. Uh, reciprocation basically means that if you are taking a measure, there is not a risk that somebody is, ba is basically crossing the border and doing the thing which is being prohibited. And uh, uh, macroprudential uh, measures of non-euro area countries are absolutely uh, normally reciprocated by the euro area countries. <coughs> to avoid the convention does not make exactly any difference. Also from the point of view of behavior, um, you know, we were speaking before about the Czech Republic. Uh, Slovakia and the Czech Republic have exactly the same profile in the use of macroprudential policies, uh, despite of the fact that they have a different, uh, a, a different monetary policy and, uh, a, and a different uh, uh, exchange rate, uh, exchange rate uh, regime. And to be even more clear, I cannot tell you uh, uh, why and what, but two days ago, a uh, very important euro area country has been outvoted in a vote uh, where there was a coalition of euro area and non-euro area uh, member states, and this is completely normally and accepted because this is the, 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 rule, uh, the rule of the game. Now, having said that, and this is my second point, what really makes the difference is that the UK is getting out of the European Union. Uh, I, I, I think that today people have not been speaking much about this, but of course, for us, it's the real shock. It's a real shock for two reasons, because the Bank of England has been one of the inventors of monetary, of modern macroprudential policy. We have been all inspired by the Bank of England for, for years. And, and the second, because the financial market is in the UK, which basically means also that a lot of the financial risks are, are, are in, the, in, in the UK. Now, another reason why uh, to be in the euro area or not does not make a difference in the SRB is also the fact that the ECB itself has its own machinery in terms of macroprudential policy. So it's not that there is not a new euro area competence on, on, on macroprudential policy. The ECB can top up uh, national measures, something which we cannot do, it's not in our mandate. Uh, the ECB has uh, the, the SSM, uh, the Euro area has the SRB. I hope one day there will be uh, also uh, guarantee, guarantee schemes. We, on the contrary, we do simply soft law, uh, basically uh, warnings and recommendations. And uh, one day historians will have to decide whether this has been useful or not, because, of course, we, 
we don't know. We don't know exactly what is the transmission mechanism of the, all of these type of things. Uh, we hope it functions, uh, and uh, the counterfactual is extremely, uh, extremely, extremely uh, difficult. Now, the fact that countries are treated equally, which is very nice, it's very nice, but it's not sufficient, because you can do all equally the same stupidity. <laughs> so, is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, so the real point is, to me, is not whether we are equal or different, but to avoid that we are all equal in the incapacity to catch the next crisis. Because, you know, if we are joint, I mean, uh, joyously, uh, 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 let's say, going against the, the, the wall, uh, this, this is not, not great. And some of the points which I would like to say um, uh, now have a bit to do with one aspect of, uh, of the title of this conference, which has not been discussed much, uh, is the periphery and beyond. So the beyond has not been discussed uh, much. I, my, my, my story is uh, I, I have been uh, uh, 10 years in the EU neighboring regions division and then 10 years in mac doing macro proof. So I've always been crossing this, this type of things. Um, I, I, I think the, the, uh, you have been making reference at the end of the fact of how much we all depend on the international cycle of lending. Um, uh, and uh, one could add also how much we all depend today upon geopolitical risks, which, which by the way, are in no way limited in, 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 the, in the region in, in which, we, we, which we are. Uh, we, we should also at a certain time try to discuss a bit our language. Uh, we speak about the EU periphery. Uh, this is a very Eurocentric concept and which is very much based on the idea that Europe is at the center of the world and there is a periphery. I don't know how many people like to be in peripheries. There are places where peripheries are perfect and places where peripheries are, are horrible. But if you go to ask to somebody in Moscow or in Istanbul and they are basically deciding about the future of Libya without the EU, whether they are the periphery of us, I'm not sure. And, and I, I doubt that next week London will proclaim itself as the periphery of, uh, of, the European, of the European Union, which basically means that we have conceptually to think about a, a, a language, but also a concept which is, uh, which is, which is, uh, which is new. Um, I think we have also to think about our own interests to a certain extent. So, um, one of the things I, on which I've been reflecting very much in the last months is um, what is happening in Lebanon. Uh, it would be impossible to do a Vienna, a Vienna initiative for Lebanon, but Le Lebanon is of course uh, potentially affecting us. Um, what is happening in Turkey? Uh, with a Turkey trying basically to engineer uh, credit growth artificially uh, and with, with the risk that uh, it would explode again after one year after, uh, after the crisis. So it's clear that we have to, uh, to think uh, about this type uh, of things. Now, let me finish by saying what could be useful for a policymaker from meetings like this. Um, well, one, of, one of the things which we, are, we have to think about is, to a certain extent, what is um, the, the social source of legitimacy of our work. Which is, uh, there's a very <coughs> end, this is something which is extremely important, uh, which basically means that we have to reflect in the medium and long term on what is the international role, what, what is the role of international agreements, what is the role of the EU, uh, what must be on the country pan-European, what must be a national. Um, because at the very end, these things can last exactly in only how long they are supported by a large part of, uh, of, uh, of, of society. Now, one aspect which is not being mentioned, but uh, to a certain extent, is something on which I am thinking a lot, is also the diversification of uh, preferences uh, in, uh, in our public opinion. So if we had some countries to which you know, the, the public thinks that finance is to a large extent done to finance the Green Deal, and other countries in which uh, the public opinion that the most important thing is to renationalize finance because on the contrary, you want local control 
on resources to do your, your own uh, work, then in the, in the long term to bring these things together is really difficult because the, the view behind <coughs> this is, is, is different. Um, and other things I wanted to, to say and then I will finish. We have been speaking a lot about differences among the countries. We should not forget that there are new elements of differences which are even more complex. And by the way, you have a direct impact on the execution of macroprudential policy. One of the enormously clear difference of our society is uh, the difference between urban areas and uh, uh, the countryside. If you are, w uh, our execution of macroprudential policy to, to address uh, residential uh, and commercial real estate problems is confronted with the fact that in Frankfurt you have a dynamics, 150 kilometers from Frankfurt you have a completely different dynamic. Um, people in some countries are very happy to pay with a telephone. In other places they see this uh, de 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 uh, desertification of the system because you don't have branches anymore. There are places where there are no branches anymore. And then of course what is happening is that society at the same time is confronted with these two trends. And that you have to run a policy which makes possible to implement technologies because you have to con basically contain costs, but at the same time you, make, you need to make sure that people in the countryside find a bank if they need it. And I think these are some of the issues on which we will have to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesco. That was very uh, deep, deep thinking and challenging. Um, Andrew, can you <coughs> give us the answers to all of that, please? Probably not, no. And I apologise for being late. I think that uh, academic, late. I just had to start. academic timetables tend to be a bit less punctual than <coughs> in the policy world. Uh, um, so I, I'm going to address uh, a question that I think was flagged by the organisers in the, in, the, in the brief for this session, which was, do macro-prudential policy frameworks hold any lessons for developing frameworks for institutional cooperation in other areas including monetary policy, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to adopt uh, more of a global perspective on that question. And what I want to do is um, frame my contribution to the discussion around four propositions, um, and some of those may be, may be slightly abstract, but, but hopefully they'll provide some degree of provocation for, for, for discussions more generally. Um, but I do acknowledge, of course, that my, that my learned central bank colleagues on this panel are the real experts and do this day in, day out, whereas I, this is, this is simply a hobby for me to, to occasionally uh, think about these questions. So the first proposition, I think, is that the specifics of macroprudential policy mean imperatives for authorities to cooperate internationally and develop cooperative international governments, uh, governance mechanisms are stronger and more pronounced than for monetary policy, at least for large countries. Um, and... Um, <coughs> And some of, the, some, of, some of the voices in the field contend the success of macroprudential policies in delivering more resilient, less crisis-prone financial systems will depend on the development of global standards and a global regime for cooperation. Now, the, the literature on, on, this, on these questions, on cooperation between authorities on, macro, on financial stability matters, is not vast, not least because of the relatively recent development of, of macroprudential as a, as, a, as a separate policy field. Um, and most of the attention has been <coughs> on the development of policy instruments, collection of data, national institutional design questions. I think the most important contribution on those questions of international cooperation to date has probably come from Stephen Tuchetti and Paul Tucker. And, and they suggest that there cannot be effective macroprudential policy without international co cooperation. Um, and they highlight a number of specifics related, relating to financial stability that create strong imperatives and indeed a necessity to have very well developed cooperative arrangements for macro uh, policy. And in particular, um, they frame financial stability as a problem of the commons. The commons. So individual risk takers uh, generate wider sets of negative externalities that go beyond their immediate transactions and then imp impact the economy as a whole uh, and potentially <coughs> deplete a common resource. Um, the, the, the point that they, they, they really drive at is that open capital markets, large cross-border financial flows, multinational financial institutions simply mean 
no safe, no state is safe on its own. And they argue the case for uh, a global financial resilience standard that, that states should meet. But the point is a pretty basic one, that uh, you, can't, you can't have a world where US authorities know only about US firms, and euro area supervisors know only about euro area firms, and so on, because the qualities and characteristics of financial stability as an inherently global systemic phenomenon. But what, what, what really comes to the fore here then is, is questions of information and trust. And a key question is what information do supervisors need to exchange so that they can trust the supervision of one another's banks? And you know, it's very difficult for supervisors to properly assess their own banks without the exchange of significant amounts of information. Um, and that, of course, it depends on a deeper understanding um, of the vulnerabilities of other countries' financial systems. Um, so to, to, for supervisors in a given jurisdiction to assess whether their own banks or banking systems meet a given resilience standard is almost impossible without a comprehensive assessment of other jurisdictions and an assessment of the prospects for spillovers between countries if any one of them gets into trouble. Now, that kind of cooperation is, is obviously a substantial undertaking. And we've seen an example of it almost in a, on a micro scale in um, <coughs> Sven's uh, example um, um, in, in the Baltic states. But more broadly and globally, it's not delivered by micro supervisory colleges or other committees of the fa Financial uh, Stability Board. Um, so there is this need, I think, uh, and it's increasingly recognised to develop international cooperative mechanisms that go far beyond what is currently in, in place as part of a, a global initiative. And that kind of re it's obviously where that kind of reasoning takes us. A crucial difference with, with monetary policy, however, is, is that macroeconomic data or authorities used to inform the announcement of a periodic monetary policy decision will have usually been in the public domain for some time. Macro potential authorities face a much different challenge to monetary policy authorities in that, in that sense. Uh, when making a decision, a macro author potential authority effectively re releases information about the state of the financial system that was previously private and not widely available. Uh, because in part of their assessments rely on confidential supervisory information. What then happens is that depends on the market's judgments of policy action and the information re revealed. So one of the implications of that is that, the, that there is this case to be made for information sharing between authorities. So to, I'm going to use some very crude basic examples, but if US authorities become concerned about the risk of their <coughs> institution's involvement in certain euro area uh, exposures, Sharing that information with Eurozone authorities will enable, or should enable, European authorities to benefit from their US counterparts' knowledge in setting their own policies. So a simple case would involve a situation where one country takes action based on concerns about exposures in another part of the world without communicating that to another country, with the result that that precipitates some sort of fall of confidence and a crisis in that country before it itself has, a time, has, has, has time to take action and build resilience through its own policy response. Um, so a simple hypothetical uh, example, but the imperative for authorities to cooperate and develop information sharing procedures where macro financial stability matters concerned is, is, is a very strong one. The proposal that Jetty and Tucker put forward is for supervisors from the Eurozone, United States, UK and Japan to check one another's financial stress tests with a combination of IMF, BIS and FSB oversight. Um, for, the, for the EU in such a, 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 a regime, strong reporting requirements and, and cooperation arrangements across all EU members and near neighbours would obviously become a much stronger imperative if that kind of thing uh, came to pass. So when I was looking at the evolution, uh, second point is, that, um, is about institutional dynamics. And when I was looking at the evolution of the EU macroprudential regime around 2013-14, it occurred to me that that was partly a story of institutional dynamics and bureaucratic uh, turf. So one of the things the ESRB was asked to do was coordinate with international institutions and relevant bodies in third countries on matters related to macroprudential oversight. Uh, 
Um, now, one of the things that, that, that's true about macroprudential is that legal scholars have noted that the macroprudential framing involves concepts, countercyclical dynamic policy adjustments, that are difficult to pin down from a legal perspective and don't sit comfortably with EU law. And it's also true that the European Commission took a much closer interest in macroprudential policy than it ever has in monetary policy, at least to my knowledge. And I think the reasons aren't hard to fathom as to why that, that, that materialised. Um, time varying policy adjustments that directly change the amount of capital market players have to hold is seen as impinging on, on the level market playing field on the, the, um, of the single market. Uh, so there are single market rationales and potential fears of financial protectionism for countries, um, especially those outside of the Eurozone. And for that reason, we see this need to report under Capital Requirements Directive 4 to, to the SRB uh, macro prudential uh, policy intentions so that they can... It's not the only reason, but it, certainly, it was certainly a, a, a motivator, if I recall the debates at the time, so that they can assess the case and spill over policy possibilities, with the SRB in turn making recommendations to the Commission where this is thought to be unwarranted. Um, so I think for, for single market reasons, the Commission has, has a background presence in macroprudential policy in a way that isn't really the case in monetary policy, but that in turn feeds into the report, reporting requirements of national authorities outside of the, of the Eurozone, and is one of the reasons why, why they are more expensive, very specific institutional EU dynamics for that. Um, the third point to flag, of course, is that macroprudential is very new in most places. Its institutional arrangements, including those for international cooperation, are still very underdeveloped. There's a huge task to build more co uh, extensive cooperative arrangements. Macroprudential is, is, is in a phase of experimentation and learning uh, by doing. And one of the consequences of that is it's a more common pattern for policymakers to try to learn from monetary policy than the other way around. Um, indeed, in, in the UK, some macroprudential policymakers have indicated to me that their main ongoing intellectual objective in relation to that project is to arrive at an equivalent of inflation targeting for macroprudential policy. Um, given the dynamic evolving nature of financial systemic risks, um, which means the policy itself is supposed to be dynamic and responsive to new emerging risks, um, that might be that might be debatable, and certainly that notion of a of an international resilience standard put forward by Cicchetti and Tucker remains very hypothetical and indeed aspirational. So macroprudential's version of constrained discretion probably is going to require a lot more discretion uh, and a little less constraint that, than than monetary policy. Although that comes with all kinds of tensions and problems. Um, so, for, for those reasons, I think that monetary policy makers probably will find relatively few applicable lessons from macroprudential policy until it's matured as a field. Um, but I want to finish off with by saying, uh, by, by flagging a fourth proposition. Um, and it, obviously, we have a, a state of affairs where countries and jurisdictions around the world up, divide their macro policies into three pillars, monetary, fiscal stability, uh, uh, financial stability, and fiscal. Um, one of the things the financial crisis revealed from an academic's perspective was that how, how permeable the boundaries between all three are. So monetary policy operations, often for financial stability purposes, in the form of asset purchases, have multiple fiscal implications, for example. So the interesting footnote to finish off with is that some staff at the BIS who were of course very much at the forefront of developing the macro prudential conceptual framing have had a long standing <coughs> position that macro policy macro prudential policy itself should be part of a broader macro financial stability framework in which monetary and fiscal policy also play a role in reducing the risk of financial stability um, to broader macroeconomic stability. And of course that would involve adjusting current monetary frameworks. They become more responsive to emerging systemic financial risks with a view to allowing monetary policy to occasionally be adjusted to contain those risks even when there is relative price stability according to inflation data. And traditionally that kind of argument has been vastly unpopular in central banking circles. Um, uh, 
and I, I can think of one occasion in Jackson Hole in 2003 where that was, that was played out in, in public to some extent. Um, but it certainly remains a, a priority for some of the, uh, the Bank for International Settlements. And so there may be some merit in saying you cannot rely on macro prudential policy and supervision alone to deliver financial stability. Now, if that position of financial stability uh, should have more of a footing in monetary policy, becomes more popular, then for reasons already explained, enhanced mechanisms of communication between macro prudential and monetary policy makers and within states outside of the Eurozone would then become a real institutional imperative, however unlikely that possibility might seem. That could be a potential driver for um, enhanced cooperation between the two policy areas and for states outside of the Eurozone to, uh, to have more footing in monetary policy discussions in the Eurozone. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's, it's, it's very good to have the ideal and the aspiration uh, spelled out. Um, although some of us might question whether your ideal is the right ideal. Um, <laughs> it's not my ideal. <laughs> <laughs> can, 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 can we come back to, to Christian and ask you to tie it all together for us? Um, you, you've had to think about this in Romania, and I, I know it's been it's it's been a deep thought, and financial stability has been has been foremost in your in your goals. Would you mind saying where we are, where where you are, and your sure. closing thoughts? Then then we'll 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 have questions. We have we have time yet, but I'd like to ask each of the uh, participants to answer the questions broadly. So f for when we get specific questions, but also feel free to comment on on what what the panelists have said as part of your response. So Christian, over to you, and thank you for this heroic. Uh, Undertaking. Thank you for uh, for asking me to do the to do double duty. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, let me try to frame what I want to say. I can't expect to tie it all together, but it does dovetail. What I have to say does dovetail into previous speakers' remarks. Uh, happily enough, what I tr I'm trying I will be trying to do is number one give you a flavor of what in Romania we have tried to do over time. Uh, and point out that this is not a singular experience. <coughs> Croatia has done much the same with some, let's say, different uh, uh, flavors and takes. Um, then look at what the lessons are from phase one and the current phase two, uh, if anything, and then try to sort of link this to monetary policy in a similar way to what Andrew uh, indicated, more as a possibility. Uh, in our case, it's something we've done. Uh, first of all, I, um, I'm bringing you back to, let's say, the kind of mid noughties so 2003 to 2008, the onset of the GFC, the global financial crisis. Romania, uh, as was the case with many emerging markets at that time outside of the EU, uh, was facing a, a very strong inflow of capital of all sorts, uh, from FDI to short-term exposures essentially um, most of which was not going into tradables. It was actually going into non-tradables, therefore with little to no impact on productivity, and therefore with little expectation that the worsening external balance of the country would be closing because of the kick-on effect of productive investment on the export sector within two to three years, as is the normal case with that kind of thing. Uh, we couldn't really because we were on track to join the EU, uh, which we did in 2007. We couldn't really tighten policy, and since it was forex denominated flows coming in, it would have had made, made little sense to actually increase interest rates. It would have act just made uh, institutions, um, for, for <coughs> banks first and foremost, more interested to do that, and therefore it would have exploded aggregate demand rather than reduce it. So we had to think outside the box. We actually, because we needed to liberalize uh, um, capital, uh, uh, let's say, um, elements of the account gradually, finishing with the money market in uh, uh, 2005, we actually had to reduce the policy rate while we were expecting uh, both a buoyant domestic situation and continued in and increasing inflows into the country. That was quite daunting. So we started looking at what is now known as macro-proof. We didn't have a name for them then. Uh, 
we were like Monsieur Jourdain, uh, writing prose without knowing it. Uh, and I believe that, uh, that Boris and his colleagues were doing the same uh, a bit further south uh, from us. Uh, what did we do? We started with debt service to uh, uh, income for households in terms of both consumption and mortgage, and then with a cap overall. We had loan to value, and then we had, a bit later, we had a limit to total exposures to unhedged borrowers for banks in relation to their own funds, which was 300%, which was actually a freeze on what existed as the status quo. We didn't want to find an ideal number, frankly, because we didn't know whether something could be benchmarked in that sense. We also had minimum reserve requirements increasing to an all-time high of 40%. Those are normally a monetary policy tool, but they also have a prudential impact because of the liquidity they save, which can be returned to banks in moments of crisis. What happened is that uh, Forex, as a total of non-government lending, was 65% and growing when these measures were adopted as a package. It stopped there, it reversed for a while, it went down to about 60%, after which it started going back up again. So we found out that, number one, we were actually doing this to supplement the limited capacity of monetary policy through traditional mechanisms to cope with, uh, let's say, excess domestic absorption. Number two, the measures were effective only for about one to two years, after which they became porous and people could game them, and people yeah. did game them. So we had to continue innovating at the margin and not just work with one type of measure, but with an array of measures, while being frowned upon because these measures were not that different in the thinking of the moment to capital controls. And obviously for a country trying to liberalize as much as possible so that its path into the EU was assured, these were not a good thing to have, to wit, the 300% uh, let's say ratio of uh, exposures to unhedged borrowers in forex compared to on funds was transformed into very tough stress test parameters even before the global financial crisis so for domestic currency we had one set of parameters they were about double for euro exposures and about 30 to 50% for dollars and swiss franc uh, and obviously these led to higher capital requirements for banks even during the spring and summer of 08, for example, before anything else than the credit crunch coming from the US hit Europe and Romania subsequently. What was the lesson? You need these measures, uh, either because you can't really act for monetary policy or because financial stability concerns were important. And I here refer to what Michael, I think, pointed out earlier. We were very concerned about the balance sheet consequences of a massive disorderly depreciation because of the accumulation, let's say, of, of capital flows leading to unsustainable appreciation before. For three reasons. If you looked at the pass-through into inflation or disinflation from appreciation, it was massively different. It was about 40% from depreciation into inflation. It was only about 25% the other way around. The second thing is you couldn't rely on it to actually bring inflation down because people did not perceive nominal appreciation to be sustainable. The third thing was Romania had an export sector with quite a high sh share of imported inputs, so you wouldn't have the benefits of depreciation showing up in your competitiveness numbers because of that, it would be diluted. And thirdly, we knew that people who had borrowed massively in Forex really did not have either the income streams nor the assets to pay debt if a massive change in exchange rate happened. And that change did happen because the peak to trough change in the nominal exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the euro for Romania mid-07 to uh, early uh, 09 was about 30%. That's quite sizable. It would have led to default for individuals, which did show up uh, ultimately in MPL numbers, it would have led to problems for companies. And just to give you a flavor of how much that was, we had the household sector in terms of bank exposures going from nothing to about half of total non-government lending as a stock by the beginning of 2009. So quite a lot. We needed to be careful about that. And that leads me to, let's say, my final remark. I think if I were to quantify now, I would suggest that Something that has been visible for the past year or so, especially from the BIS 
Carstens and, and Silva, for example, proposing integrated inflation targeting, looking at both, let's say, financial stability concerns as well as the normal monetary <coughs> policy concerns is something we try to do with costs. We were looking at the implications for financial stability and we refused to contemplate the worsening of external balances plus of the fiscal balance in order to attain for a short while our inflation targets. We prefer to actually miss them and have a better shot at medium term price stability which was actually illustrated by the fact that inflation expectations turned out, despite targets being missed repeatedly, to be quite well anchored to the, let's say, projected path of, uh, of, of inflation going forward. So we did that with an expectation that if we had really relied on closed economy, kind of naive textbook interpretations, it would have defeated both the macroeconomic monetary policy mandate and the, price, uh, the, the financial stability one. So, that's a kind of a summing up of what we try to do. What are we doing now? I think that the framework and Romania's participation in the ESRB dialogue uh, is valuable. You find out what other countries are doing. It turns out that most of the time, despite differences in where you are in the financial and business cycles and the nature and intensity of your risks to financial stability, that may differ. But the core things don't differ that much because of interconnectedness. Um, so I think that's valuable. Right now, Romania, of course, is applying two of the capital buffers coming out from, from legislation, the conservation and the systemic risk buffer. It has, because of the rapid nature uh, of lending to households yet again, based on the very wage-forward model that was adopted by the administration uh, in government in Romania up to November, it basically not only reinstituted the debt service to income limits, it extended them and uh, is now one of the voices asking for analysis on subsidies to home ownership to be reconsidered because this is no longer the problem it was in early uh, 09 where a repricing downwards of uh, um, real estate which was the main source of collateral for banks would have basically led to increasing problems for the banking sector and to need for more capital than was already injected. So that's where we are right now. I think there's, there's a great concern for both things. I think there's also an awareness that the mandates in terms of price stability and financial stability may not always align this neatly. Yeah. But the idea is that the flexible way in which Romania has been doing inflation targeting for a while is at least macroeconomic risk management, if not the BIS, let's say, version of integrated inflation targeting. And it seems to be possible. One doesn't know whether it's going to be always this smooth, as, as I said, but it can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, th that, th that, that raises so many issues late in the day that it's really a pity that we're finishing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to open the floor for questions.